Thank you. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the final humanities forum of the season. My name is Denise Maringolo. I'm the acting director of the Drescher Center for the Humanities and I'm an associate professor of history here at UMBC. I am delighted to be with all of you. While I, of course, wish we were gathering in person together on campus, I'm grateful that technology allows us to hear from our wonderful speakers and to make our programming more accessible to a broader audience. The Drescher Center is putting the finishing touches on a terrific spring humanities forum series, and we hope to have the formal schedule up on our website soon. Uh, and that address is dressercenter.umbc.edu. Um, just before we begin, I need to make a few announcements. First, I want to acknowledge that UMBC was established upon the land of the Piscataway and Susquehannock peoples. Over time, citizens of many more indigenous nations have come to reside in this region. We humbly offer our respects to all past, present, and future indigenous peoples connected to this place. May this acknowledgement be understood as a first step, both towards necessary repair work and toward achieving true diversity, equity, and inclusion in all aspects of our communal life. Um, second, I would like to preview our first event for the Spring Forum. On Thursday, February 24th at 4 p.m., we will hear um, from a talk by Kelly Wisecup, who is the an Associate Professor of English at Northwestern University. Her talk is called Indigenous Reading in the Archives of Empire, Birch Bark Object Lessons at the 1893 World's Fair. Uh, at the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, the Powhatan, the Potawatomi writer Simon Pokagan circulated a small birch bark pamphlet that recast colonial narratives of empire and discovery, connecting them to indigenous homelands and histories of dispossession. Uh, Dr. Wisecup's talk offers new insights into what Pokagan called the pamphlet's, quote, object lessons, its implications for 19th century indigenous literatures, and its connections to contemporary conversations about public space, monuments, and memory. That event will also be held virtually, and more information will be forthcoming in the spring semester. Um, as we turn to this evening's main event, I want to thank the Asian Studies Program and the Department of History for co-sponsoring this talk by Dr. Constantine Vaporis. Uh, I want to let you know that, that Q&A will take place directly after the lecture. Questions can be submitted at any time in the Q&A chat box. To enable the Q&A box, please click on the three dots at the bottom right uh, corner of the screen and, and select Q&A. We will have live captioning during this event, and you can enable captioning by clicking again on the three dots and selecting multimedia viewer. A special thanks to Vital Signs LLC for providing their live captioning services this semester and helping us to make the Humanities Forum more accessible. The talk tonight will be recorded and made available on the Drescher Center's YouTube page. You can also connect with us on uh, social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And now, finally, allow me to introduce my colleague and our speaker for this evening, Constantine Vaporis. Dr. Vaporis is a professor in the Department of History, and he's been the founding director of the Asian Studies Program. He teaches courses in Japanese and East Asian history. Dr. Vaporis has also been a Drescher Center Residential Faculty Fellow and a member of the Drescher Center Board. He's the author of several books, including most recently, Voices of Early Modern Japan, Contemporary Accounts of Daily Life During the Age of the Shoguns. Um, the second edition of that book was published in March. And Samurai, an Encyclopedia of Japan's Culture Warrior, Cultured Warriors. A revised paperback edition of that book will be published in September and include an expanded number of both color and black and white images. Dr. Vaporis also works to make his scholarship accessible to the general public, and to that end, he's collaborated with TED-Ed on the production of an educational animation titled A Day in the Life of a Teenage Samurai, 
He's also working as an editor and consultant for a historical signage project in Japan designed to revise the interpretive signs at castles, temples, shrines, and major tourist areas. Dr. Vaporis has been the recipient of a number of prestigious fellowships, honors, and awards, including a Fulbright, a Fulbright Scholars Award and an NEH Fellowship for College Teachers. Most recently, he won a residential fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton for the 2020-2021 uh, academic year to continue work on a collection of biographies of samurai titled Sword and Brush, Portraits of Samurai Life During the Tokugawa Period. By focusing on the lives of 14 individuals, this collection aims to capture the larger story of the transformation of the samurai from largely illiterate landed warriors to an urban cultured bureaucratic elite. In tonight's talk, a lord, a pauper, and an artist, he will share some of the findings from this fascinating project. So without further ado, I present to you, Dr. Constantine Vaporis. Thank you very much, Denise, for the kind introduction and to the Humanities Forum for this opportunity to share with you my research. Of course, I'd also like to thank the sponsors, the Joshua Center Asian Studies Program and my home department, the Department of History. Uh, since this may be my only opportunity to express publicly my thanks to my department, the Dean's Office and the University as a whole for being so supportive of the scholarly life of professors in the humanities and social sciences at UMBC, myself included, uh, in terms of research funds and most importantly, time off to research and write. I feel very fortunate to have spent 32 years so far at UMBC. It's this kind of support that has led to the prize-winning scholarship of many of my colleagues, including today's announcement of Dr. Marjolaine Carrs winning the Mac Daddy of History Awards, the Kundal History Prize, which was just announced today. Congratulations. I hope uh, Dr. Carrs is out celebrating and not listening to my lecture. So let me uh, go ahead now and share my sc uh, screen, my PowerPoint with you. Okay, well, this presentation is based on material from a book manuscript that uh, Denise mentioned that I've been working on for a number of years, together with other, some other projects, entitled Sword and Brush, Portraits of Samurai Life in Early Modern Japan. By early modern, I mean the Tokugawa period. Uh, the two objects in the main title, Sword and Brush, are symbolic of the so-called twin ways of the samurai, the military arts, and the civil or literary arts. By brush, I mean the writing brush. And by sword, I actually mean two swords, a long and a short one, that samurai wore and which served in part to define their hereditary social status. These objects are symbolic of the dual paths that Tokugawa period samurai were to follow. And the tension between the two is one of the key themes explored in the book. I use the word portrait rather than biography or life history in the title consciously as the accounts with a couple of exceptions do not provide traditional cradle to grave narratives. The word portrait is also aspirational in a sense, since it suggests a bringing to life or capturing of the character of an individual. The book consists of a series of narratives of the lives of 14 individual samurai, retainers from a variety of domains across the country and who held a range of positions in their respective domain hierarchies. Four of the chapters are dual portraits. In one case, a lord and a vassal, in two others, father and son. And in one other, two artists, both of whom worked in Edo, the name for pre-modern Tokyo, and the capital of the Tokugawa government, or shogunate, at the same time. Collectively, their 14 lives span the entire Tokugawa period, which allows me to explore certain themes and to consider change over time. In Hermione Lee's book, biography, a very short introduction, she writes that there are no rules for biography. She writes it is shape-shifting, a variable form. In accord with this, in many of the chapters, I adopt different approaches to the life of an individual or individuals. Sometimes I use a single text or a set of texts, some of which you see here. 
or an incident, for example, a revenge killing incident, or a concept like that of memory landscapes as they pertain to individual samurai to eliminate some broader theme. In this presentation today, I'd like to talk briefly about some of the reasons for writing a history of the Tokugawa samurai to suggest a few of the issues and challenges, and then to present three mini portraits of my subjects. Given time constraints, the second and third portraits will really be just quick sketches. First, by way of introduction, I should explain the title of my talk, which begs several questions. You might ask, aren't the samurai already a popular topic in academic and popular discourse? Why do I need to write about them? And why is it necessary to put people back into the history of the samurai? Aren't they already there? Can you really have a history of the samurai without people? Of course, the samurai are a topic of great popular interest, as evidenced by the roughly 300 million uh, hits generated on Google. And an engram for samurai and other famous warrior groups in global history, which reveals a fairly consistent growing interest in the subject since 1860. Tellingly, the photos on the Google search page I just showed you are primarily staged photographs using non-samurai actors from the 1860s. Popular culture, including Hollywood films like The Last Samurai and museum exhibitions have contributed to the creation of a stereotyped image of the samurai as fierce but noble warriors, an image that's difficult to get past. And I would suggest that it's in part because of the popularity of samurai and all of the myth-making that has resulted from it that no Western scholar has attempted a volume dedicated to just the samurai of the Tokugawa period. Fortunately, I was able to convince my editor at ABC Clio not to title a previous book of mine, Samurai, an Encyclopedia of Japan's Fiercest Warriors, but rather Samurai, an Encyclopedia of Japan's Cultured Warriors. Nevertheless, as you can see at the bottom of the image, the preliminary title that the editor came up with still exists in places on the internet and has assumed a life of its own. I also had no say about the image they selected for the cover. The editor might have used this photo of an intense looking Nakaoka Shintaro instead, but had he, I would have urged him to include this other photo of him as well. Inside the cover of the encyclopedia though, and in the animation I created with Ted Ed earlier this year, or last year rather, this is still shot at the top there. And in an earlier monograph of mine, I stress the balance between the two sides of the samurai. My efforts in my current book as well are geared towards presenting the samurai as fully dimensional human beings, real people, not hackneyed stereotypes. One more word about museum exhibits on the samurai and why they too have compelled me to write this book. In these exhibits, artifacts like helmets, suits of armor, and swords are treated as objects of art but lack a human context. In other words, they are disassociated from their users, the identity of which is usually ignored, and from a consideration of how the artifacts, such as these unusual helmets topped with rabbit ears, eggplant in the bottom right, or the god of longevity in the, bo in the bottom center, how they were actually utilized and what meanings were attached to them. In many exhibits, there also has been an aestheticization of the sword without any recognition of the sword as a weapon, that its technical perfection made it the ultimate tool for samurai to kill and to maim others, or to be tested on cadavers. Given the popularity of the subject of samurai, it's not surprising that there are indeed some books on the subject. I can talk about the historiographical literature in the Q&A if anyone is interested, but for brevity's sake here, let me say that there are a few texts written by samurai that have been translated into English but almost all are from late in the period. There are a few biographies, two of shoguns, one of which you see here on the right, and a couple of top officials. And there are also some several uh, general histories of the samurai in English. Jonathan Clement's book at center is uh, one of them. But the general histories focus on periods of history prior to the Tokugawa period, or they focus just on military history. In general, these works treat the samurai as a uniform warrior class fundamentally unchanged since the ninth century, one which followed a code of behavior ascribed to them known as Bushido, the way of the warrior. Both issues, their identity as a uniform, unchanging warrior class, and the existence of a fixed code of behavior that defined their lives are equally problematic. In fact, Bushido is largely an invented tradition of modern times, much as is the case with the concept of chivalry. 
Nevertheless, almost all major museum exhibits on the samurai, and there were about 10 of these in the US during the decade prior to the COVID pandemic, including this one from a Nashville. They are guilty of buying into Bushido and are full of all kinds of information. Despite what mu museum exhibitions would have you believe, the samurai of the Tokugawa period, seen here in these images engaged in various activities and in different poses, are unlike the Japanese warriors of earlier times in a number of ways. For one, the Tokugawa period con constituted a distinct era in samurai history. It was the only one, in fact, in which they made up a fixed hereditary order, comprising roughly six to seven percent of the population. They occupied the top rung in a four-tiered social system of hereditary estates, monopolizing political and military functions in society. In principle, they left manual labor to the other social groups, the farmers, the artisans, and the merchants, and lived off the productive labor of the peasantry. Samurai enjoyed many privileges, including the right to carry two swords, the public use of a surname, and a place in the domain's retainer corps. They also enjoyed the expectation of commoners' deference. In principle, a samurai could cut down an offending commoner, but of course the reality was far more complicated. Secondly, Tokugawa period samurai were a military elite presiding over a society that remained at peace in stark contrast to earlier periods in Japanese history. Nevertheless, the history of the samurai by Clements that I mentioned a moment ago devotes 23 of its 36 pages on the Tokugawa era to the only two battles that occurred during the period, both of which took place during the first two decades of the 17th century. That leaves a total of just 13 pages to discuss the samurai during the other two centuries of the period. A third point is that the Tokugawa samurai were not a landed aristocracy. They were a military elite who became disconnected from the land over which they once exercised direct authority. Daimyo rulers undercut their vassal's authority over the land and the people living on it, thereby increasing their own centralized control. In addition, feudal elements in the social contract between lord and samurai vassal became increasingly fictive in nature. Instead of samurai receiving fiefs and land from their lord in return for military service, the majority received stipends from the lord's warehouse. However, what complicates the view that the samurai were simply stipended city dwellers is the fact that this was true in only about 80% of the domains, and the other 20% Mostly in peripheral parts of the country, samurai remained on the land and had limited fief holding and limited fief holding practices continued. Another reason the samurai of this time were different is that they became increasingly dependent on their daimyo overlords. During the preceding warring states period, samurai could change lords as circumstances warranted and as opportunities for advancement presented themselves. But during the Tokugawa peace, it was no longer possible to change lords. So loyalty became unconditional and increasingly impersonal in nature. Once the realm was pacified in the early 17th century, samurai gradually underwent a transformation from a group of generally illiterate warriors to a cultured bureaucratic elite, a transformation that was critical to the vitality of the era and to the forging of one of the longest periods of peace in global history. Under peacetime conditions, samurai struggled to redefine their identity as an elite who demonstrated loyalty through bureaucratic service rather than military action on the battlefield. And as I noted earlier, an important part of that redefinition was to maintain a balance between the twin ways, the military and civil arts. What were those? Well, I drew up this list here from one of the diaries of a different samurai that I've studied. In the military arts, you can see horseback riding, horseback archery, gunnery, and a whole list of different kinds of activities under the civil uh, and or literary arts. Let me make two final general points. Two and a half centuries of peace naturally eroded the military character of samurai, but not in any uniform or linear fashion. Many samurai that Westerners encountered after the opening of Japan in the mid 19th century were skilled warriors to be feared. Samurai remained fiercely proud of their heritage and identity as warriors. And so the story of the samurai of earlier times remained an important part of that identity through visual and literary culture. These are mushae, or warrior pictures, popular 19th century prints with themes from the 14th 
and six to the, through the 16th century. Secondly, samurai regimes imposed themselves across Japan through military force, but sought to secure their gains through a peace settlement, whereby coercive violence was reduced to a threat and a remedy of the last resort, supplemented by the authority of law. In other words, to a large extent, samurai were enjoined from exercising the military functions that had been central to their identity. This created another important tension in samurai life, a tension arising from the lack of opportunity to demonstrate their martial skills and valor on the battlefield. This resulted in the samurai's hypersensitivity in defending their honor and consequently the development in samurai culture of an ideology of honor violence. These are some of the basic themes about samurai that emerge from the biographies. Let me now turn to the three samurai that comprise the first part of my title, a lord, a pauper, and an artist. This talk and the book I'm writing properly begins with the story of a lord, or more precisely, the son of a lowly warrior, the, or rather the lowly son of a warrior who became a lord. His name was Yamauchi Katsutoyo. In Japanese name order, the surname Yamauchi comes before the given name. We see representation of him here in this bronze statue in full armor astride his horse, holding a spear. Katsutoyo's life is a vehicle through which I provide a narrative of the divide between the wartime of the war, late Warring States period and the beginnings of the Great Peace of the Tokugawa period. Katsutoyo is the archetype of many of the daimyo of this transitional period. Born into a family of warriors of rather imprecise lineage, he experienced the loss of family members in warfare at an early age, leaving him at 14 without a male guardian to protect him. Katsutoyo spent the following eight years or so basically as a masterless warrior, although he briefly served four different samurai and fought in battle for the first time at age 15. Katsutoyo came of age at a time when the polity of Japan, which had been comprised of hundreds of competing small-scale domains, was slowly being put together when a number of daimyo began to forge larger domains, as seen in this political map with the major daimyo domains color-coded. You'll notice that the name Yamauchi is nowhere to be found here. Around this time, actually two years before this map of 1570, Katsutoyo, who was a late bloomer, at the age of 23 became a low-ranking retainer of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, seen on the right here. Hideyoshi was in turn a vassal of Oda Nobunaga on the left. Nobunaga was the first of the so-called to be unifiers of the late 16th century. Hideyoshi was the second asserting military control over the country by 1590. There are numerous stories that Katsutoyo became Nobunaga's vassal, but there's clear evidence that this is incorrect, despite the fact that stories to that effect have become widely accepted. I can explain why that might be the case in the Q&A, but this fact calls into question one of the stories about Katsutoyo that I'll tell you in a moment. Katsutoyo's fortunes rose with Hideyoshi's over a career of a little less than 30 years as Hideyoshi's vassal, Katsutoyo's land holdings increased in roughly eight stages, from a small territory producing 200 koku of rice, a koku is about five bushels of rice, to one that produced 60,000. In the Tokugawa period, a samurai controlling a territory producing 10,000 koku was the minimum to be considered a daimyo. So 60,000 represents a middling-sized daimyo. Hideyoshi, Katsutoyo's lord, died in 1598, and two years later, rival claimants to his authority amassed in two large armies with over 150,000 combatants, the scene depicted in this screen painting. There at Sekigahara, the largest battle in Japanese history to date, Tokugawa Ieyasu and his armies on the right side of the screen won a decisive victory, effect effectively bringing to an end the Warring States period. Three years later, in 1603, his authority was secure enough that he was appointed shogun by the emperor, a largely symbolic figure who lived in Kyoto. From this point, the Tokugawa family dominated the country through its family-based government, the shogunate, which continued to rule Japan for 265 years. One price that had to be paid to achieve this great peace, though, was that the Tokugawa did not attempt to fully centralize its authority, allowing this 260-odd daimyo to stay in place as semi-independent rulers of their domains. Katsutoyo stood out among the many men who rode on Hideyoshi's coattails to become daimyo by making the wise decision in 1600 to side with Tokugawa Ieyasu's coalition rather than the rival one that claimed loyalty to Hideyoshi's heir. Significantly, 
he was the first daimyo who was not a vassal of Ieyasu's to openly side with him. Katsutoyo, whose battle surcoat you see at the bottom of the slide, had but a small army of 2,000 men and played only a minor role in Ieyasu's victory at Sekigahara. Nevertheless, his actions beforehand in pledging allegiance earned him Ieyasu's deep gratitude, if we can believe one local history, and a huge promotion in being transferred from a 60,000 koku fief in central Japan to a 240,000 koku domain uh, to, in Tosa in southern Shikoku, which comprised the southern half uh, of the island of Shikoku, the pink area on the map. Such a major promotion from minor daimyo to province holding daimyo was extraordinary, and the Yamochi family would remember its debt of gratitude to the Tokugawa family for 15 generations. The steepness of Katsutoya's rise was unusual, and his rule as daimyo of Tosa for just under five years was both typical and unusual in a number of ways. But the reason I find his life history particularly fascinating is in part due to some of the stories associated with, with it, stories whose veracity is in question or for which there is little corroborating evidence. Nevertheless, these stories live on embedded in his life history and have been memorialized in various ways. They start out small, but get bigger and better, I think. Story number one, as a 15 year old, in his first armed combat, Katsutoyo was one of a party accompanying his overlord as they embarked from the Lord's castle and were set upon by a group of enemy warriors. While his companions turned to flee, Katsutoyo bravely charged the enemy. Realizing what Katsutoyo had done, the others reversed course and joined him, successfully routing the enemy. Well, this is pretty standard uh, hero material. Then we have story number two. As a 28-year-old, he was fighting in support of his then lord, Hideyoshi, against the forces of the Asakura family. When Katsutoyo was shot in the face by an arrow from the bow of an enemy warrior of high repute. This is said to be the actual arrow. Like Prince Henry, the future King Henry V of England, who was shot in the face with an arrow in 1403, Katsutoyo did not retreat. Despite the serious wound with the arrow piercing his face, somehow, somehow he was able to kill his opponent. According to one account, he later instructed a vassal to step on his face and extract the arrow, which the vassal was understandably initially reluctant to do. Interestingly, the vassal retained possession of the arrow, which remains on display today at a local museum where I did research, and was part of an exhibit on Yamauchi Katsutoyo and his wife at the Edo Tokyo Museum in Tokyo in 2005, the same year that a year-long Japanese historical drama on Katsutoyo and Chio his wife aired on national television. The story of Katsutoyo and the arrow, like the story of his wife and the horse that I will relate next, may have been fabricated or perhaps just twisted or inflated over time. Despite Katsutoyo's deep wound, there is no evidence of it in the two extant portraits of him. Of course, this is not conclusive proof of anything since formal portraits were often idealized rather than realistic depictions of important political leaders. By contrast, we know that Prince Henry of England's facial wound required extensive surgery to extract the arrowhead and to repair the damage, but must have left his face drastically scarred for the later king appears in formal portraits in profile only so as not to reveal the wound. Regardless of the extent of the wound, undoubtedly Katsutoya was himself greatly pleased that in no small part due to his bravery, his Lord Hideyoshi rewarded him with a fief double the size of his previous one. Finally, we turn to story number three, Chio and the horse. It is impossible to recount the story of Katsutoyo without telling the story of Chio, although we're not even sure that that's her name. I'd be happy to talk about this afterwards. It's impossible to recount the story of Katsutoyo without telling the story of Chio, his wife, who's seen here in this bronze statue with a magnificent towering horse. Chio is depicted as a confident figure, her right arm extended upwards and forward, Again, I can talk more about this in the Q&A, but it's quite unusual for a woman to loom so large in the history of a Japanese daimyo. And the fact that there's a statue of her standing alone without her husband, who is just around the corner as a separate statue, speaks to her importance in local history. Chio was the daughter of a minor military lord, and according to a history written about a century after her death, she used her entire makeup or dressing fund, similar to a dowry, that she brought into the marriage as a gift to her husband. These funds gave him the means to purchase a fine war horse. 
For samurai in the mid 16th century, a strong and agile horse was necessary for success in battle. Indeed, he staked his very life on his steed. Katsutoyo had seen the animal for sale at the local horse market, but being without the means to purchase it, returned home dejected. After he explained what he had seen to his wife, Chio opened her mirror case, took out the 10 gold coins that were inside it, and gave them to him. The mirror case has been memorialized at the same site where their marriage is commemorated. According to the same history, after purchasing the horse, Katsutoyo took part in an equestrian exercise involving the mounted retainers of Oda Nobunaga's, where his impressive steed caught that Lord's attention, somehow leading to Katsutoyo's quick rise through the ranks. Visitors to Kochi, the castle town of the domain Katsutoyo would later rule, or to Chiyo's birthplace in Gifu, will find the basic story repeated on historical signage, in touristic literature, as well as through public statuary. As seen here, Yamauchi Katsutoyo and his wife is the inscription. Depicts Katsutoya dressed in ordinary garb of a samurai standing besides the horse, much shrunken in size relative to the two horses in the Kochi statues, while Chiyo is positioned in front, holding the reins. The story of Katsutoya and Chiyo was immortalized in the late 19th century in several woodblock prints like this one that were part of a series of images depicting famous individuals in Japanese history who were considered as models of moral behavior. The story of Chiyo, of course, also resonated with the notion of good wife, wise mother that was being extolled in various sectors of Meiji society at the time. The tale of Chiyo and Katsutoyo was also often repeated in pre-war elementary school textbooks. These prints, statues, and the stories surrounding them reveal Katsutoyo and Chiyo as one of the most celebrated samurai couples in Japan. Although there's good reason for skepticism about the veracity of the basic story of the horse, it is so well entrenched in Japanese popular culture that its status may be unassailable. These stories alone are not why Katsutoya's life is worth retelling. As I've suggested, his experience as a founding daimyo and one who moved into a completely new territory are an important chapter in the early history of the period. After Sekigahara, 88 daimyo on the losing side were domains were confiscated and their family lines wiped out of existence while 43 other daimyo were transferred to new, often less productive territories. By contrast, Katsutoyo, as I told you, was rewarded with a transfer from a large fief to the 20th largest domain in Japan, four times larger than his previous one. The move to Chitosa would take Katsutoyo and his small band of retainers into alien territory, the former domain of one of the most powerful daimyo on the losing side, one whose family had long roots in the island, Chosogabe Morichika. This meant that the Yamauchi would be entering Tosa in essence as foreign invaders. Katsutoya had to be concerned not only with the Chosokabe retainers, but also with a larger group of rustic farmer soldiers who were opposed to the entry of the Yamauchi to Tosa. The Yamauchi were vastly outnumbered and knowing the dire situation his forces would face in entering Tosa and occupying, trying to occupy the castle, Katsutoyo petitioned Tungao Ieyasu for military assistance. Iyasu sent a trusted vassal and a sizable force of fighting men, which were met with resistance by the Chosogabe retainers. who threatened to fight to the death, defending the castle if their lord didn't get to keep at least half of his domain. A standoff ensued for several weeks, but in the end, resistance was put down from within when some senior Chosogabe retainers secretly opened the gates to the castle, allowing the waiting forces to storm in and take possession of it. To display his displeasure at the prolonged resistance, Tokugawa Ieyasu's representative took the head of heads of almost 300 Chosogabe men, exposed them to the elements for all to see, then sent them preserved in salt to Tokugawa Ieyasu. This cleared the way for Yamauchi Katsutoyo, by then a 56-year-old battle-weary warrior, and the remainder of his army to enter his new domain. Katsutoyo was determined to demonstrate that there was a new ruler in town, and so he asserted his authority in a violent and in an underhanded fashion. To celebrate the inauguration of his rule, Katsutoyo hosted a sumo wrestling tournament at the picturesque Katsurahama Beach, and all village headmen and rural samurai were encouraged to attend. Taking advantage of their presence, Katsutoyo's forces seized 73 members of the resistance and crucified them in the shallows of Urado Bay. With this, most of the resistance was crushed, although two years later, there'd be one more minor uprising by a former retainer 
that was put down with an equally heavy hand, bringing direct resistance to an end. This story is important to tell because while the Tokugawa period is renowned for being a realm at peace, it is easy to forget that the peace was forged in blood, not just at Sekigahara, but in numerous locales across Japan, where resistance to new rulers by retainers of the old lord and uprisings by peasants, sometimes in tandem, took place. The Yamochi were not unique in facing opposition. Across Japan, domains were being remade, and new rulers pressed the local population with burdensome levels of taxation, including the costs for building new castle towns. In some, it's easy to forget that the Tokugawa system, the shogun's government based in Edo, and the more than 260 daimyo domains were regimes of conquest, that the shogun, the daimyo, the warriors, meaning the samurai, constituted a new class that achieved domination through the application of unprecedented military force. Once active resistance to his rule had been suppressed, the senior retainers of the previous Lord exiled, Katsutoyo could make a fresh start in his new territory, where he didn't have to remove retainers from ancestral lands or long held fiefs. As a result, he was able to take bold steps towards centralizing authority, including taking control of twice the amount of land that the former daimyo had. According to local histories, he personally decided to site his new castle in Kochi, a different, more strategic location than the predecessor castle. This was part of an intense period of city building across Japan that is perhaps without parallel in global history. Less than two years after his entry into Tosa, Katsutoyo was able to move into his new castle, from whose donjon he enjoyed a broad view of the growing city below. This is the view today. Castle keeps like Kochi and these others were designed as the last stronghold, but ironically, most were built after the civil war stopped. They remained symbol towers, emblematic of the daimyo's power, but never utilized for their intended purposes. Through a combination of carrot and stick type policies, the vast majority of the retainer corps took up residence in the castle town, where they were granted plots of land on which to build residences. Through the physical relocation of the samurai in the towns, and other policies, daimyo like Katsutoyo undercut their independent authority as landholders, creating functionally separate groups of samurai as urban-based warriors and peasants as rural farmers. The attack on the samurai retainer's independent authority would continue throughout the 17th century, transforming and fief retainers largely into stipended military men and bureaucrats. Katsutoyo died in 1605 without an heir, Perhaps he was directly responsible for this, but Katsutoya was unlike most daimyo in not keeping concubines in his residence in Kochi or in the shogun's capital of Edo, to which daimyo were required to travel every other year. This would seem to suggest that he and Chiyo did indeed have an unusually close relationship, one worth memorializing. After Katsutoya's death, Chiyo took the tonsure and the name Kenshoin, living out the remaining years of her life in the Kyoto temple. After Katsutoyo's death, the Yamochi family rule continued for an additional 14 generations through the bloodline of his younger brother's son. In the 19th century, he was honored as the founding lord. Actually, both he, his immediate successor, his nephew, and Chiyo were all deified as kami, as gods with a small g. There was nothing unusual in deifying the founding daimyo of a domain, but the deification of a woman, Chiyo, the wife of Katsutoyo, together with the first two lords, was extraordinary. As I noted earlier, we cannot write the history of Katsutoyo without Chiyo. Katsutoyo's successors would not have to experience warfare again for more than two centuries. The peace dividend would be great. It led to opportunities for the samurai to follow new intellectual, artistic, and scientific pursuits, in addition to their prescribed duties as military men and civil administrators. Accordingly, my second and third sketches today are of a Confucian scholar and an artist, respectively. Tani Tanai was also from Toso. He was a, a samurai Confucian scholar and poet, the author of 14 books, and for a time a professor at the Domain School. He appears in one of the middle chapters of the book, and through his life experience, I tell the story of the financial difficulties that the vast majority of samurai experienced as a kind of chronic condition from the late 17th century onward. For this talk, I've referred to Tani Tanai as a pauper, and in doing so, of course, I'm taking some literary license. 
I sketch, I sketch this portrait primarily by utilizing one major source, a 20 odd page document that Tanai created, a record of daily necessities is my translation. Literally, it's a daily record of rice and salt. I was in, in and this is a some couple of these first two pages of the book. I was inspired to write the chapter this way after reading Laura Thatcher Ulrich's Midwife's Tale, which draws on the midwife's diaries to recreate the social world of late 18th century Maine. Tane's record records memos, several budgets, and copies of correspondence between himself and his merchant financier, a man named Saitania Hachirobe. As historians, we question, we have to question our sources, not just whether or to what extent they might reflect reality, but also why they were created in the first place. Why did Tanai, a low-ranking samurai from one of the three famous Confucian scholar families in Tosa, create this record? And why did it cover only six years from 1748 to 54? We can never really know the answers to these questions, but perhaps part of the answer stems from the fact that these were extraordinarily difficult times for him and his household. The record of daily necessities, which he began at the age of 20, was likely an attempt to come to grips with the financial crisis his, house, his household faced by inscribing a record of this time on paper. Perhaps he recorded the account and did not later destroy it as a reminder of the time, as a useful guide and a warning to his son. The ledger itself was a reflection of this painful time in his life. Several of the pages and the cover of the original document, which you see in the top left there, were brushed on paper that had already been used on one side reflecting his sense of thriftiness. Tanai's long-term fiscal crisis was fostered by a number of factors that were largely out of his control. For one, while the Tokugawa economy was at its most basic a rice-based agricultural one with taxes paid in rice, it became increasingly commercialized and urbanized with the vast majority of samurai living in the castle towns. For Tanai, who was a stipended rather than, than an enfiefed retainer, Residence in the castle town meant that he needed cash to pay for the daily necessities of life, for many foodstuffs other than rice, such as miso and soy sauce, for furniture, for clothing, paper, brushes, and many other things. This need for cash required him and other samurai to exchange the rice they would not consume in the household for currency, and merchants were needed for that. There were a variety of other reasons why samurai grew dependent on merchants. For one, the rates of for the conversion of rice, which was store, st stored in bales, like those to the left, into cash fluctuated. There existed a complicated multi-metallic monetary system of gold, silver, and copper. Also to blame was a stipend system with just twice yearly payments, which exacerbated a chronic state of indebtedness. We can also point to what might be described as the samurai's principled attitude of detachment from commerce and calculation. From Tanai's account, we can see that Saitania was not just a creditor, but also became his financial analyst or consultant as well, thereby expanding the role of the merchant in the lives of the samurai. This, their particular relationship was complicated by the fact that Saitania was a student of Tanai's, but Saitania appears not to have allowed this to impact their main relationship as creditor and debtor. Lastly, a samurai's debt hell was the result of another basic structural problem. That is, retainer stipends generally remain fixed, a function of the hereditary based system of lords and samurai. Additional income could be earned if a retainer received a special appointment for a particular job, but this was not always possible because there were usually too many candidates for too few offices. The fact that a retainer stipend did not increase without special appointments resulted in a greater dependence on deficit financing through loans. Not only did stipends generally fail to increase, they actually decreased for long periods of time from the 18th century on due to the forced loans or paybacks that daimyo across the country imposed on their retainers, and which could vary from 10% all the way up to 50% of a samurai stipend. Faced with such financial uncertainty, samurai could try to lower expenses, but this was possible only to a certain extent. It could move to the countryside for a fixed period of time if they were given permission to do so. It could reduce the number of servants employed in their household. Tanai only had one, one being the bare minimum. It could engage in side jobs, meaning by employments, if permitted, and this was permitted only of lower samurai. Jobs, essentially piecework, creating handicrafts such as making paper lanterns or sun umbrellas, pottery, calligraphy brushes, and so on. 
They could con uh, continue to try to apply for jobs and to hope. They could pawn their possessions, even their swords. They could volunteer for service in Edo, for which there were special subsidies, and they could take out more loans. Tanai adopted the last three options. Like many of his contemporary samurai, Tani Tanai was in debt hell at the time of his account. His debt was two and a half to three times his annual stipend, with interest rates in the range of 18 to 21 percent. He was stuck in a cycle of debilitating debt from which he seemed unable to extricate himself. It must have frustrated him to no end that he was in such debt to a merchant, a person who occupied the lowest rung in the idealized social system of the time. But nowhere in his account does he allow his emotions to reveal themselves. Unable to break out of a cycle of debt, Tanai wrote Saitania asking for his advice. And a week later, as requested, Saitania delivered a budget that he had drawn up for Tanai. But Tanai was unable to follow his budget. And six months later, he wrote Tanai again. Our household has tried to economize, but I am ashamed to say there has not been a month since then in which we have not spent more than our budgeted income. So he, he confesses that he's been unable to keep the budget that was worked up for him. And in another part of the letter not seen here, he lays out a plan to restructure his debt. He proposes to the merchant to convert his debt to interest-free old debt that would be paid in installments over time and to take out a new loan to cover his living expenses until the next stipend payment was dispersed. Still unable to discipline himself financially, he requests that Saitania act as his overseer and distribute his income to him in monthly installments. Part of his plan to reduce his budget was this proposal, was a proposal to move to what he called a mountain residence, to move out into the countryside, which required a formal request. To do so, a samurai had to petition to be declared officially, quote, poverty stricken, which allowed them to live temporarily on the land outside the castle town and to withdraw for a time from official duties. This was permitted to allow the household time to recover its economic health. Tanai ends his letter to the merchant with a familiar refrain, namely that he is, quote, ignorant of these financial matters and requests Saitania's opinion and further counsel. Here we can plainly see the samurai's deference and humility, even if one were to argue that his language was simply a rhetorical device. In the end, Saitania refuses. Tanai is forced to seek out additional loans from other sources, including a pawnbroker. In Tanai's future, more than 20 years after this record of daily necessities, lay a major career upswing, a rare promotion and appointment to a number of positions in the domain bureaucracy, which brought him significant increases in income. But this late career path was rather unusual. The segment of his life covered in his account was by far more typical of the existence of a low-ranking samurai from the mid-18th century on. Samurai like Tanai lost control of their economic destinies ceding control to merchant financiers. Reading Tanai's correspondence, one senses that his financial affairs were never far from his mind. They were a struggle that he was never free from and which must have consumed much mental energy. What is also striking from Tanai's account is the social inversion that it reveals. Tanai became dependent on Saitania, not just for loans to keep him afloat, but also for his financial expertise and services in financial planning. In addition, the language that Tanai used in his correspondence with Saitania is very polite and at times self-deprecating. This is not the language that one would expect a wielder of the two swords to use in communications with his putative social inferior. In short, Tanai's life experience provides an example of how over the course of the late 17th to 18th centuries, social status and economic power grew out of alignment. Finally, we come to the artist, the third sketch, Odono Naotake, and I'll conclude here in about five minutes. A bust of whom you see here, and as he is depicted on the cover of a major Japanese magazine. Naotake lived in Kakunodate, a subfief of Akita domain in northeastern Honshu, in an area still famous today for its samurai housing and cherry blossoms. His family residence still exists today. Akita was one of those peripheral areas of Japan that I mentioned where the practice of subinfudation continued during the Tokugawa period. So now Take was a direct vassal of the Lord of Kakuno Date, subfief, who was the head of a branch family of the daimyo of Akita domain. 
At the same time, Naotake was still duty bound to the daimyo of Akita himself. And as things turned out, he became the painting instructor of both his immediate overlord and then the daimyo, who later in effect stole Naotake and made him his own direct retainer. Naotake made a name for himself as a painter, a profession we do not normally associate with samurai. And these are two of his more than 50 works that survive, a number of others burned, unfortunately. His life story reveals, for one, that art, like the scholarship of people like Tani Tanai, could be conceived of as a form of service performed by a loyal samurai to his lord. Now, Take was a samurai who pursued an education in art and not a hereditary specialist painter. It was a big distinction. And it was largely because of this distinction that he was able to explore new avenues of artistic expression rather than to adhere rigidly to the established schools of painting. At the same time, his career also demonstrated that forging a close connection to the Lord, in fact, he became his personal instructor, through this unique career pathway could cause jealousy and perhaps career-ending, if not life-ending, political infighting. Indeed, he died at the age of 31 under uncertain circumstances. Secondly, as a non-inheriting son, Naotake was able to enjoy a peace dividend and having the freedom to explore an alternative career pathway other than succeeding to his father's position, a pathway other than administrative or military service. Now, Take's father, Naokata, was a middle-ranking samurai and domain instructor in spear fighting, but his son did not show any interest in carrying on his father's position. For Naotake, the balance between Bun and Bu, the civil and the military arts, tilted squarely towards Bun. Thirdly, his life's work reveals the important connections that Japan maintained to the Western world, despite policies that at face value made Japan appear to be a closed country. He integrated Western art techniques into Japanese painting, particularly naturalistic details, single point perspective, and illusionism. In doing so, he drew on the growing body of information about the Western world that entered Japan through its southern portal of Nagasaki the only port that was open to Europeans, which after 1639 meant only the Dutch, were sequestered on Dejima Island in Nagasaki Bay. Among Naotake's most famous works were the elegant and meticulous illustrations that he made for the New Book of Anatomy, which was one of the first Western medical textbooks to be translated into Japanese. It had a major impact on Japanese cultural history and spurred a boom in so-called Dutch studies the translation and study of Western books in the Dutch language. Now, Take's body of work includes a wide array of subjects, such as children and pet dog, and not just the more traditional bird and flower paintings. Particularly noteworthy are works he created using European techniques to portray distinctive Japanese vista, including Mount Fuji, seen here on the right. In this and other paintings, he created 3D effects by utilizing lighting to cast shadows and create strong tonal contrasts. The Akita Ranga School, literally the Akita Western Picture School that Naotake was a key member of, has come to occupy a position as one of the most important schools of painting in the Tokugawa period. This reassessment places Naotake squarely in the center of a small group of samurai whose work was of great importance in the history and culture of Japan. Akita Ranga, however, was not simply art created by Akita Samurai in a Western style. Its unique character lay in the pairing of traditional themes, particularly bird and flower paintings, and materials such as silk and water-based, not oil, pigments, with Western techniques of shading and linear perspective. At the same time, Akita Ranga also evidenced strong links of ties to China, as Edo period artists and intellectuals in general were still deeply inspired by Cynic culture. While serving as Lord in Edo, Naotake lived at the domain residence north of Edo Castle, where he was inspired to paint the now famous work Shinobazu Pond, seen here. This was his crowning achievement, a painting emblematic of the Akita movement in its fusion of Japanese, Chinese, and Western elements. It is also the first Edo period Western style painting in Japan to be designated an important cultural property which is an indication of the position of Akita Ranga in Japanese art history. For reasons that are still unclear, Naotake's career came to a rather abrupt end. It appears that his dedication to art and his closeness to the Lord aroused animosity among other Akita domain vassals. 
We do know with certainty that he was dismissed from service while serving as Lord in Edo in order to return home and into domiciliary confinement. This is one of the lighter forms of punishment that a samurai could incur, obviously far better than being ordered to commit ritual suicide, but nonetheless a stinging rebuke for him. Whatever the reason for his dismissal, Naotake died under house arrest less than half a year later under circumstances that remain unclear and his family was ordered to relinquish his artwork to domain officials after Naotake's death. On top of this, it must certainly have been disturbing to the Odano family that a letter of pardon from the Lord arrived at Naotake's home the day after he passed. So today here, I've presented bits and pieces of several portraits of Tokugawa samurai, that of a Lord, a pauper, and, a, and an artist. And now invite your questions and comments. Thank you for your attention. Let me go ahead and stop sharing. Thank you, Constantine. Uh, what a wonderful way to close out uh, this series of the Humanity Swarm for the fall semester. Um, we're opening up now to questions in the comments. Um, if you can utilize the Q&A box on the right hand side, or if you can't find it, you could also use the chat box. Um, and we invite any questions or comments from the audience. Think, okay, I see lots of great presentation. I think um, Gina Lewis, did you have a question? I see that you raised your hand, but if you have a question, you'll have to type it into the box. Technology. Okay. Uh, okay, she said okay. So still. Okay, so we have a question from Sydney Coniglund. Apologies if I pronounced your last name incorrectly. Um, why was the wife of that one samurai so important? Ah, well, I, I hope I gave s several reasons uh, for that. The story of of her donating or giving m funds that made possible made it possible for her her husband to be noticed by the Lord, and how somehow this miraculously led to his quick rise in status is the main reason given. There are uh, this this is based on a history that was written a century after. Um, Katsutoyo lived, and there are other variations on it that she gave him some money, but that he by that time was a samurai of some standing and could have afforded the horse. There are others, other stories that say that uh, she gave him money to to buy a suit of armor. Um, there, there are all different mutations on this uh, or permutations on on this story, but it, it seems. Um, you know, that it's it's hard to kind of uh, to 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 find out. You know, get to the bo bottom of it uh, since we have uh, this one account. You know, cent century later, but it's become so embedded in in the history. There's also other events I didn't get a chance to talk about. How uh, during a period before the climactic battle in 1600, uh, she and a number of other wives of daimyo, whose loyalty was suspect, were being held hostage by the leader of the side opposing Tokugawa Ieyasu. And while she was uh, being held hostage, she was able to smuggle out messages to her husband. So doing that was exceedingly dangerous. Um, and uh, so she's deemed to be a very uh, brave uh, woman. She was also very educated, which was uh, unusual at, at, at that time. Uh, so those are some of the reasons and apparently the, there was something to the bond between them because, you know, like I mentioned, it's very unusual for daimyo not to have uh, a whole slew of concubines, uh, both in the home domain in the castle town as well as in Edo. The fact that he did not, um, again, strikes me as quite anomalous. Okay, our next question is from uh, Siobhan Hedgepeth. Um, Siobhan asks, will you create a course from this perspective? Uh, well, I, in the past, I have taught courses on the samurai, um, but um, it, indeed, I, I, I might do that. And with a focus on biography, I uh, certainly could be in the works. Thank you for the, the comment. 
Um, the next question comes from Bolu Adednaron. Are there any records of non-Japanese samurais in any prior periods? Uh, well, that, that's an interesting question and in part depends on how you define samurai. As some of you may know, there, this uh, last year there is a book called The Af uh, African Samurai, which tells the story of a um, man whose identity is debated whether he was a free man or a slave who uh, came to Japan on the Portuguese ships and uh, caught the attention of the same Oda Nobunaga and um, was uh, uh, saw military service. Now, whether one can define him as a samurai is debatable. There was also another uh, Englishman who was given uh, kind of honorary samurai status, Will Adams, uh, the man historical character upon which the miniseries and movie Shogun was based. Uh, so there are these kinds of special appointments, but um, these people were never given kind of important appointments in the administration of the daimyo. So we might think of them as kind of special appointments or honorary samurai. So good question. Okay, a uh, question comes from Gina Lewis. Um, Gina comments that the artwork was beautiful. As a military dependent in my early years, a veteran, a military wife, and the sister of a fallen soldier, I'm so happy to see this presentation that highlights the other dimensions of the life of a warrior. I look forward to following your work and reading more. And Gina says that they would also love to take a course based on this project. Uh, thank you. It's very kind of you. I, I think it's you know stressing that both sides of the samurai is really important and makes them more more human and also more more interesting than than just fierce warriors who were bent on committing suicide. Okay, we have two questions from Stephen uh, Go. I will answer. I will ask the first one. Um, if the armor displayed is considered used for stage play, then what did the samurai wear for battle? Did they wear any armor? If so, what did it look like? Ah, well, the, the photographs, I think you're alluding to the photographs that I mentioned, uh, those, those were mainly taken by foreign uh, photographers in Japan as kind of staged photographs there. Um, the armor itself was not stage armor, uh, simply the people posing were not um, samurai, um, uh, but by and large, those photographs that, that, are, that uh, popped up on the Google, Google page. Uh, in, indeed, uh, arm, armor was was created and, and worn uh, during the uh, processions of daimyo uh, to and from uh, Edo. Uh, the warfare start, stopped by uh, after 1615, so there weren't occasions to wear it in, in battle. Um, so it was mainly in, during ceremonial uh, events. And then again, at the end of the Tognao period, there's another period of civil war in which uh, armor is routinely worn by samurai as well. Okay, Stephen's second question is regarding the last section on now Toke's light punishment. Um, they said it was quite engaging. How is it that he did not commit ritual suicide? Well, we don't we don't know how he died. Um, some uh, um, there, there was uh, an attempt to find that out shortly after his death and some uh, information collected, which seemed to suggest that he died of illness rather than ritual suicide, but there, there's there's no way of of knowing. And it, it seems that the Lord must have uh, had second thoughts about the punishment for him to have lifted the punishment um, after after six months. So it uh, was unfortunate timing that he died and wasn't able to you know live long enough to see that his status was re reinstated. Okay, and I think this is the last question. Um, it's from Mitchell Agate. What was the purpose of transitioning the samurai into a hereditary and fixed role? Well, that that um, the the attempt was, you know, in the late 16th century to uh, stabilize society, and you know, prior to that, the boundary there were no bound fixed boundaries between uh, warriors and farmers. In fact, most of the, you know, the uh, so the, the purpose was to clarify social roles and to help, you know, prevent daimyo from raising armies from the peasantry. So the uh, purpose was to disarm the countryside 
and there and to strengthen the position of uh, samurai by giving them the exclusive monopoly on the means of violence, the right to use the, the two swords. So it was essentially a attempt to you know end the civil wars of the 16th century and bring order to society, and it was quite effective in that there were more than two centuries of, of peace. If there are no further questions, I think we'll close it out. And I realized I forgot to introduce myself um, to those who don't know. Um, my name is Courtney Hobson. I'm program coordinator for the Dresher Center and help to run the Humanities Forum. So um, it's a great to have you all join us this, this evening. And many thanks again to uh, Dr. Vaporis for his engaging lecture. And I hope that you all will join us in the spring. And the talk will be made available online as soon as tomorrow. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you all.